So we continue our discussion about antiderivatives and integration. So then I will repeat for you, since it's been a few days since you might have thought about it, the, <coughs> the fundamental theorems that we need to know. They are, so first off we have this notation that if the derivative of big F of x is little f of x, right, so then this is a mathematical sentence. It could be read aloud in English as the derivative of big F is little f. So there's another way to say this. There's another way to say this. You can say it as follows. This, right, and this left-hand side is read aloud as the antiderivative of little f is big F and then now how do I finish the sentence? Plus C, right? Plus C, and this plus C is indicating that antiderivatives are not unique. Okay, so then uh, the example I gave to illustrate that point was that, you know, I can give you these two right here. So this is like Jeopardy. Right, Jeopardy, where I give you the answer and you're supposed to respond with the question. So, whose derivative is 2x? Right, x squared, that, that can go in there, but is that the only thing that can go in there? No, in fact, x squared plus any constant at all has derivative 2x. Okay, so then now, I'm not going to go through the work again, but we demonstrated that what if what if we have two different antiderivatives of a function? What if we have two different antiderivatives of a function, then what is the difference between them? A constant, right? So then that's, that's good to know because here you can see that in this second line I have given you infinitely many functions who have derivative 2x. And if there's that many, you might wonder, well, maybe there's some strange function in the universe that man hasn't considered yet and maybe the derivative of it is 2x also. But the answer is no, that's not possible. Every derivative, every function which has derivative 2x, okay, looks like x squared plus c for some c. Okay, so any question about these two lines? Okay, so we talked about uh, derivatives, and then we said, well, here's antiderivative, which just means doing that same procedure in reverse. And then we momentarily waited for a little bit. We waited and said, now we're going to talk about this other thing where I said, okay, here is, here is a function between A and B. <coughs> I said, okay, here's X is A and X is B and then maybe I have some nice uh, well-behaved function Something looks like this. Okay, so then now, that's a, that's a shape, right? The thing I've shaded in, it's a shape. Okay, it doesn't have a name. That's not a named shape, like a circle or a rectangle or any of the other shapes that you learned in classes before this one. It's not one of those. But nevertheless, we all sort of look at that and agree that it's a shape, it has an area. Right, so then you know the areas, or you're supposed to have learned the formulas for areas of other functions, of other shapes, I mean to say. So this one ought to have a formula too, right? If all the other ones have formulas, this one should have a formula. Right, so if this is the function f of x, then the formula for the area of this shape is written in this way. It's written in this way, and this is pronounced the integral from a to b of f of x dx. Right? This, when it's evaluated, gives you the area <coughs> indicated. So now, one thing that we touched on on Friday, but since that was a week ago and it was immediately preceding the break, I want to make sure that this thing is really lodged in your mind strongly. Notice how close these two things appear. Right? Don't these appear really similar to each other? 
Okay, just visually, what is the difference between them? The A and the B, right? So, you know, it's not like we just sort of lost creativity and said, well, we're just going to make it look just like that other one, but for no reason, right? No, there's a significant reason why these things look so similar to each other. So then now, if you recall, if you recall, we computed one of these, right, in the in the old-fashioned way, I guess you might say. We computed a sum, right, and then we used the summation formulas, and it was really boring, right, and it was really tedious, and we did it the long way, right? So do you remember that? I hope it hasn't been <laughs> evacuated from your brain uh, entirely. So then the reason for the similarity between these two notations is the fundamental theorem of calculus, right? The fundamental theorem of calculus says the following. It says, one, if little f of x is continuous on the closed and bounded interval a to b. Okay, so first off, what that means, so this is like a sort of, for a mathematician, a weak version of the fundamental theorem of calculus because it requires it's requiring continuity. Generally speaking, it's not actually necessary, strictly speaking. So if a function is continuous, then what does that mean? It means you can compute this integral. It means that you can compute the area of that shape. Okay. That's what that requirement is saying. So if it's continuous, then you can compute the integral, the integral from a to b of f of x dx. Okay, but not only can you compute the integral, okay, you can do it with the sum and do it in that long, really aggravating way, or you can do it with the fundamental theorem of calculus, then the integral <coughs> from a to b of little f of x dx is big F evaluated at b minus big F evaluated at a, where The derivative, no, won't, we won't write it like that. We'll write it like this, where the antiderivative of little f of x dx is big F of x plus a constant. <coughs> okay, so the fundamental theorem of, of calculus is telling you the connection, right? First off, in, the, in this course, we studied derivative, right, which is a function that gives you the slopes of tangent lines to a graph. Okay, so we studied derivative, and then we did that for some time, and then we said, well, we're going to consider doing this procedure in reverse, and we're going to call that reversing procedure antiderivative. Okay, then we lo looked at that for a little bit, and then suddenly we jumped away to this other problem of computing areas, and we did all of those summations, okay, but it wasn't just, it wasn't just because we just, someone shuffled the, the contents of the book. It's because the fundamental theorem of calculus was coming. It's telling you the connection between derivative, antiderivative, and integration. Okay, so then the last thing I want to say before we start moving away from this and getting to more antiderivative techniques is this, is that this thing right here, this thing, is called an integral. And this thing right here is called an antiderivative. So a lot of authors, and even I would say instructors, are sort of confused about which one is which. Right? So then, for very, and this is because historically, these things, uh, integrals and antiderivatives were developed simultaneously by several different people, and you have all different words from all different languages which mean these things. So then, <coughs> for some, in some cases, this will be called a definite integral. And this one will be called an indefinite integral. But I would say that really that is mm, just about an abuse of notation. I would say that the proper thing, or abuse of language, the proper thing is to call this one an integral and the proper thing is to call this one an antiderivative.
and the fundamental theorem of calculus is telling you the connection between the integral and the antiderivative. Okay, so any questions about this thing? <coughs> okay, so then let's do a quick one of those just to make sure we remember the computation. So for example, let's compute this. The integral from 1 to 4 of how about, <coughs> I don't know, five, no, 4x plus 3. So this is a really easy problem. I just want to make sure that everybody remembers it. So you start out by computing the antiderivative. So what is the antiderivative of 4x plus 3? Two x squared plus three x, good. Okay, so no, pl no plus c here because, I mean you could write plus c, but it's, it's not necessary. You can do it without the plus c. Because now what we have to do is we put the anonymous evaluation bar here, one to four. Right, so then this, this is saying, this is saying you need to take this expression and plug in 4 and then subtract taking this expression plugging in 1. So this is equal to, this is equal to 2 multiplied by 4 squared plus 3 times 4 minus 2 multiplied by 1 squared plus 3 times 1. Okay, so then now it's just arithmetic, so this is what? 2 times 16 is 32, plus 12 is 44. And the minus 2 times 1 is 2, plus 3 times 1 is 5, so 39. Okay, so any question about this? Okay, so now I'd like to point something out that's kind of funny. All right, so then now, what is this 4x plus 3? What is that? It's a line. All right, so then now, what this is saying what this is saying, oops, this computation is saying <laughs> something sort of obvious that you already knew. Okay, it's saying that if here is x is 1 and this is x is 4, then this is a line, right? Does it slope up or down? It slopes up. So then just, this is, will not be exactly how it looks, but maybe something like this. All right, maybe something, the shape looks like this. Oops. So then, do you know the name of this shape? It's not a triangle. <laughs> it's not a triangle. So that's a trapezoid. As a trapezoid. So then you knew you already knew the formula for a trapezoid in this class, right? Before you got here, or at least you would know that at least a formula exists, right? So then at any rate, here we have computed, right? So so what is the area of the shaded region? Thirty nine square units. Right? Thirty nine square units. So does everybody see the connection here? Okay, good. <coughs> so then now, what the book called the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus, that's not usually what a mathematician calls the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus. The Fundamental Theorem of Calculus is usually this next theorem that I'm going to write down. It is, what it tells you is it tells you in the, the strongest way possible the connection between the derivative, the antiderivative, and the integral because they're all written simultaneously. It is that the derivative with respect to x of the integral from a to x of f of t dt is what? Who remembers? f of x. So let me ask you a question. What if I take, what if you give me a number? Let's call that number uh, a. No, not a because a is written there. Let's call the number b. Okay, now let's say that I do the following. I take your number b, I multiply it by 2, and then I divide by 2. What do I get? b, right? I do b because even though I performed an action, right, multiplication by 2, I reversed that action also. 
So then it's just like doing nothing. Right? I get B back. So then now, now it is, you give me your favorite function, F. And then I'm going to perform an integral from A to X. And then I'm going to differentiate with respect to that X. And then what do I get back? F evaluated at the X that we, that we had decided on. So what this is telling you is telling you that this, this integration procedure from A to X is the inverse operation of the derivative procedure with respect to X. Okay, so this is like saying, okay, you give me the function f, I'll multiply by 2, and then divide by 2, and then I get the same thing back. Okay, so does everybody see what this is? So this one, according to a mathematician, is the fundamental theorem of calculus. Okay, so then let's do an example of what this would mean. <coughs> a typical computation. So, for example, I could say that uh, how about f of x is this nice function here. f of x is the uh, integral from 1 to x of 1 over t dt. Okay, and I'm going to say with the restriction for now that x is greater than 1. Okay, that x is greater than 1. <coughs> okay, now before we get any further, before we get any further, I'd like for you to please draw for me, draw what this is, oops, what this is saying. This represents an area, right, from 1 to x, because I'm saying that x is greater than 1. And how about the SIGN of 1 over t between 1 and x? What is the SIGN of 1 over t? Positive. Okay, so I want you to draw the area that this is talking about. Okay. Okay, so then I'll say that that's 1, and I'll say that's x. So your drawing should look something, something like this. Uh, so, no, this would be t is 1 and t is x. <coughs> Okay, so does, what does 1 over t do? Right, to the right, to the right, it has an asymptote of y is 0, right, a horizontal asymptote of y is 0. To the left, as you go to left, what's going to happen when you get to t is 0? It has a vertical asymptote, so it looks like so. Right, something like that. Okay, so then, what is the area that is being talked about by this integral? Right, this area. Right, that area. Okay. So then now, I have a question for you. That being the case, <coughs> that being the case, then I could ask, what is the derivative? What is the derivative of f of x? One over x, right? One over x. Okay. Now I'd like to point out to you that well, one over x—that's a perfectly legitimate way to write things. Okay. So then, I'll, but you could also write it like this: x to the negative one, right? So now I have a question for you. What is the antiderivative of x to the negative one? You know, if you were to use the power rule. So, for example, what's the antiderivative of x squared? x cubed over 3, right? The antiderivative of x to the 10 is x to the 11 over 11. What's the antiderivative of x to the negative 1? x to the 0 over 0? No, 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 no. That couldn't be it. Right, so then I want you to see here, this is a function that you know and love because you had to take a math course where you saw this before, but you just didn't see it written in this way. Right, and I want you to see that the methods that we have, existing methods that we have, like the antiderivative of x squared is x cubed over 3, no problem. That works great. 
right? But remember, that's the power rule. It works for every single value, every single power n, except when n is negative 1, except for this case, right? So this case is very important, okay? So any question about this case, where well, I'm not going to go into it more fully uh, here, but w probably by the end of the week we will, yeah, probably by Friday. Okay, so any question about it? I'm just trying to foreshadow it. <coughs> okay, one more, and then we can move on to new things. Okay, so for example, what if I give you something more interesting, like f of x is the integral from, say, I don't know, from x to x squared of something great, like the sine of pi times t squared dt. Hmm, interesting. And so this one is, who knows what this looks like, right? I'm not even sure how I would draw this. <coughs> Okay, but, but, I could still ask you to compute the derivative. I can still ask you to compute the derivative. So then, <coughs> so then, what it will be in this case, what it will be in this case is that if I call this thing, if I call this thing f of t, or not, not that, I'll call it something else, I'll call it h of t, how about that, h of t, then what it will be, it will be h evaluated at x squared multiplied by the derivative of x squared minus h evaluated at x multiplied by the derivative of x. Okay, so then now the question is, is if, that, if this thing is called h, then what is h evaluated at x squared? Sine of pi what? x to the 4, right, because x squared squared is x to the 4, and then multiplied by what? 2x, good, and then minus h evaluated at x, well that will be sine of pi x squared multiplied by the derivative of x, which is 1, right, multiplied by 1. Okay, so any question about this example? Okay, so I hope you're feeling brought back into the mood of calculus. Okay, so any questions about these things? Any questions about them before we move on to new things? Okay, <clears throat> so now we're going to do section 4.5, which is called integration by substitution. And I really take almost, yeah, probably offense to this title. I guess is the is the right thing to say. So first off, I don't think that this should be called integration. It should be called anti-differentiation, and it shouldn't be called by substitution either, because of the following thing we're about to talk about. So then now, <coughs> this right here, the derivative of with respect to x of f of u. So then u, u is potentially some function of x. u is potentially some function of x. If u is not a function of x, then what will the derivative be? Zero. Right? The derivative would be zero. But if u is a function of x, then, the, then what we're saying is that we're taking the function f and composing it with u, and u itself is a function of x. So really what I'm about to write down is how does the derivative interact with function composition? Right, and so then the derivative interacts with product with the pro using the product rule. The derivative interacts with quotient with the quotient rule. The derivative interacts with sum and difference with the sum and difference rule. So the derivative interacts with the composition with the chain rule. Right? Who came up with that name? That's what I want to know. If I could go back and change something in time, I would have called it the composition rule. Okay. So then, at any rate, 
this is the chain rule. It is the derivative evaluated at u multiplied by du dx. Okay, so do you remember this, the chain rule? Okay, so another way to write this to make the composition more explicit is to say that, well, we have the derivative of f evaluated at g of x, right, so that the composition is a little more explicit, but there's a lot more parentheses. So then this will be f prime evaluated at g of x multiplied by g prime evaluated at x. Okay, so does everybody remember this? Okay, so now in a slight <coughs> mm, strange use of notation, I'm going to say the following. I'm going to say that, well, understand that d dx, this is not a fraction, right? Not like three-fourths, not something like this. And tip, generally speaking, you can't treat it as such notationally, but in this case you can. And what you can say is, is that d of f of g of x is f prime of g of x, g prime of x, dx. Okay. <clears throat> Wonderful. So now I'm going to do the integral operation on both sides. That is to say, that is to say, the integral of df of g of x <clears throat> is the integral of f prime evaluated at g of x times g prime evaluated at x dx. So then now, how about the left-hand side, right? Tell me about this. So what is this saying? I'm taking this composed function f of g of x, and then the first thing I'm doing is what? Differentiation. Okay, and then I follow that immediately without pause by what? Anti-differentiation, right? I differentiate and then I anti-differentiate. So what is the left-hand side of this? f of g of x. f of g of x. Okay, so then, here we go. And this right here is not actually that helpful of a formula, but it is the fundamental thing that we're doing today. So what are we doing today? I can summarize it like this. You have a derivative rule called the chain rule, which tells you how the derivative interacts with the composition of functions. Okay? Corresponding to every derivative rule, we have to have a anti-derivative anti unrule. Right? So this is, the, this is the undoing of the chain rule day. So we learned about the chain rule weeks ago. Now we need to figure out how to undo the chain rule. Okay, so what this is saying is that if you are computing an antiderivative or an integral, or an integral, then if you can decompose what you are integrating, anti-differentiating, into two pieces, right, into the green piece and the red piece, like so, then it is f evaluated at g. That is the answer. <coughs> Okay, and the reason why, the reason why is you could do the following procedure, and this is the way it will go when we're actually doing computations. You could say it like this. We'll say, okay, uh, I'll do it in blue here. U is equal to G of X. Okay, so if we say U is equal to G of X, then I can compute DU DX. DU DX is G prime evaluated at x so that I could solve for the differential part du and say that du is f prime of x dx. So now look, this part is the, uh, excuse me, this should be a g. Y'all got to catch me when I make a mistake, right? <coughs> this part I'm underlying lining in red is that part, right? is that part. 
So then now, what is the green part? Can you see what the green part is? So what did we say G was? We said G was U, right? So then what is the green part in terms of U? It is F prime evaluated at U, right? So that's the green part. Right, the green part, the red part. So then if you do that, notice what the right-hand side becomes. It becomes the antiderivative of F prime evaluated at U, right, replacing G of X with U. And then what do I replace G prime of X dX with? With DU. <laughs> with DU. So now... It's much easier to look at this, this uh, rendering of it, this rendering of it. So then, now, if I take f and then compute its derivative, okay, and then immediately follow it up by antiderivative, then what do I get back? I get f back, right? If I take f, compute antiderivative, and then and, uh, compute derivative and then antiderivative, I get f back. But the question is, is now, where will, I ha where will f be evaluated? f will be evaluated where? At u. So the fact that these two things are the same, so first off, why are these two things that I'm connecting in pink, why are they the same thing? Yeah, because all I did was just say u is g of x. So this procedure right here, this saying that, okay, I'm going to call, I'm going to call this piece U. U is the most common name, okay, but you can call it anything you want. Okay, because of this procedure, you're substituting the name G of X for U. That's why this procedure is called substitution. Okay, that's why the author wants to call it substitution. I would say that that is obscuring the, the mechanics of what's actually happened almost criminally, right? Because what's really happening? We're not actually substituting. That's just how it's happening. What's truly happening is that we are reversing the action of the chain rule. Okay, so this should really be called the chain rule in reverse or something like that, or the chain rule inversion. Okay, so does everybody understand the, what we're doing today? <coughs> Good, so let's do an example. Okay, so we're going to do it forwards and backwards. So then let's take some function. How about in step one, I'll say that f of x is some nice function like uh, 3x squared plus 5x plus uh, 6 raised to the 7. Okay, so that's a function. I want to compute the derivative now. Okay, so then, how do you compute the derivative of this? With the chain rule, right? With the chain rule. This, right, I'm computing a, computing a derivative that looks like the derivative with respect to x of u to the 7. So the form, right, the pattern for this will be 7u to the 6. And then what? du dx, okay, according to the chain rule. So then this will be 7, 3x squared plus 5x plus 6 to the 6 multiplied by 6x plus 5. Okay, so this is something you should have been able to do weeks, weeks ago. Okay, now, uh, how could you have done this without using the chain rule at all? How could you have done it? you could have expanded it algebraically, right? You could have multiplied out, you could have, you know, multiplied that thing by itself seven times, and then you would have had a polynomial of, of order 14 or so. Don't do that, okay? <laughs> Seriously, okay? But you could have, right? You could have. Okay, so now, let me ask you a related question, and I'm, once I write the question down, you have to pretend that you cannot see <laughs> the two lines above. Okay, so then, Please compute the antiderivative of 
7 multiplied by 3x squared plus 5x plus 6 to the 6 multiplied by 6x plus 5 dx. Okay, now we have to pretend that we can't see the line above. Okay, but now just now you can see the line above just for my next question. What is the answer? <laughs> right? What it, do you see that what I'm saying is that there are two lines. I've asked you I give you this line and I want you to see that it is this line, right? This one right here. So does everybody see what the answer is? Now now imagine that you can't see it and have a look at this. Right? How would you go about computing the antiderivative? You know, right now, without, without this substitution procedure, you don't really have a means. You could multiply this all out. That would be awful. Okay. But you could do it. Okay. But instead, what we're going to do is we're going to say this. We're going to say, okay, um, I see something that looks like 7u to the 6. Something that looks like 7u to the 6. So I'm going to just try a stab in the dark and say that u is... 3x squared plus 5x plus 6. Okay, so if I try that, then the next thing I will need is to compute the derivative, du dx. So what is the derivative, du dx? It is 6x plus 5. Okay, now, because, well, for one reason, this is a pretty easy problem, but now you should start feeling pretty good about, about things because, right, because of what? Here's this 6x plus 5. Did it show up? Yeah, it's right there. So things are starting to feel pretty good about right about now. So then the next thing you can do is you can solve for the differential part and say that du is 6x plus 5 dx. Okay, so then now have a look at the antiderivative I'm ask, asking you to compute. Can you change all of the names that have x? all of the things that have x in them to things that only have u. Okay, so then the answer is yes, you should be able to do that now. Right, you can say that this is the same thing as the antiderivative of 7u to the 6 and then du. 7u to the 6 du. And then now we can use the antiderivative rules that we already know. So then this is 7 multiplied by u to the 7 over 7. And then what else? Plus c, right? You can't forget the plus c. <coughs> okay, now the 7 over 7, those cancel. So this is u to the 7 plus c. Okay, so is this the answer to the question? No, this is not the answer to the question. Why is this not the answer to the question? That's right. What, what symbol was the question phrased in terms of? Symbol X. What is the answer currently phrased in? U. Okay, so if I give you, if I give you a question that is phrased in terms of X, you must give me an answer that is phrased in terms of X. If I give it to you in terms of T, it must be answered in terms of T, etc. So now we need to take this piece, u, and then bring it back <coughs> so that the answer is 3x squared plus 5x plus 6 to the 7 plus c. So any question about this? Yeah, it's a good question. So then this piece right here that I'm underlining in blue I'll box it in blue. This whole thing. This whole thing became this whole thing. Because, what does this formula right here say? It says that 6x plus 5 dx, the right hand side, is replaced with du. So 6x plus 5 dx, all of it became du. So this all became du. Starting to look like a John Madden diagram. <laughs> <coughs> yes? I don't understand your question.
Yes, yes. This work is what's being graded. Right, this is what, so I guess that's really the, the answer that you want to hear is, is what is being graded. So a couple things are being graded. Did you get to this spot correctly? Right, that's part of what's being graded. Did you remember the plus C? Right, that's part of what's being graded. And finally, did you do this substitution procedure correctly? Okay, this is the important thing, doing this procedure correctly. Okay, so any question about it? Okay, so now let's do an actually somewhat interesting version of this, right? This one was really boring because it was a polynomial and I wrote the answer <laughs> within the first minute <laughs> of, or even the first line, right? I wrote the answer to the question. Okay, so then let's do an actually interesting one. <coughs> okay, but not, not too interesting, right? We don't want to branch out too far. So how about the square root? I'll say, uh, I'm going to leave some parentheses right here. Okay, then I'm going to say square root of something. Let's say, how about 3x squared plus 4x uh, plus 8 dx. Okay, and then here I'm going to write 3x plus 2. Three x plus two. <coughs> okay, so now you're a little bit out of luck here if you don't like the substitution procedure because now, unless I made a mistake, there's no way to algebraically manipulate this to avoid substitution. You can't do it because that square root is keeping you from doing the algebraic manipulations that might allow you to do something. <laughs> Okay, so then what we need to do is we need to say, first off, well, we're in the substitution section, so probably going to have to do a substitution, right? <laughs> okay, so then uh, let's just start guessing blindly. Okay, so I'm going to try that u, I'm going to try u is 3x plus 2. You know, maybe I'll just, I don't know what to do, so I'm just going to try this. Okay, so then if I do that, then du dx is what? 3 and then du is 3dx. Okay, so once you have u and du, that's where you stop and say, okay, did I get it? Okay, so then I would be able to take care of this piece uh, and then 3dx. I don't have a 3dx, but I do have a dx, so I kind of got this piece. Okay, now what about the rest of it? Did I get the rest of it? No, so then what's my conclusion? this was not the correct choice for you, right? This wasn't it. Okay, so not this one. That's okay. I had about a minute of our life evaporated into nothingness, but other than that, <laughs> other than that, right, wasn't that big of a loss. Okay, so then someone give me a better choice for you. Okay, so u is 3x squared plus 4x plus 8. We'll try that. <coughs> Okay, so then du dx is 6x plus 4, and then I can solve for du and say du is 6x plus 4 dx. Okay, so that's looking a little better, but maybe not quite right just yet, because uh, 3x 3x squared plus 4x plus 8, well, okay, so then I can replace everything under the square root with u. Okay, and then I got this dx to show up, so then I can probably take care of that dx. But now I have this 6x plus 4, and I don't have 6x plus 4, I have 3x plus 2, so now what? Should we punt? Yeah, we, we're going we're gonna to do that in a minute, but not yet. So what he said is we should we should consider the square root to be fractional exponent one half. And we will do that, but now's not the time for it yet. Ah, right, so then I, I need three x plus two, but I have six x plus four. Right? Can you see that if I was to divide both sides of du by two, then I would get three x plus two? Okay, so let's, let's write that down. So then if I was to divide by two, divide by two, then 
I could say that du over 2 is equal to 3x plus 2 dx. So now things are starting to look really good, right? Because, because, now this, this thing I'm underlining in, I've underlined in red, 3x plus 2 dx, right? I have 3x plus 2 dx there, and then this piece that I'll underline in pink, I guess, 3x squared plus, plus 4x plus 8 is this. So then now can you see that everything in the antiderivative I gave you is in terms of x, but I can rewrite it all in terms of u now. Okay, so then I can re rewrite it all in terms of u, and then after I do that, after I do that all the way down here, so first off, before I do the substitution, I'm going to rewrite it like this, just so it's as clear as I can possibly make it. So 3x squared plus 4x plus 8, 4x plus 8, 3x plus 2, dx. All I did was say that I'm multiplying, I'm switching the order of that multiplication. So then after the substitution, this becomes, this becomes the antiderivative of the square root of u. And now what do I replace 3x plus 2 dx with? du over 2 du over 2. Well, that division by 2, I can just move that to the front as multiplication by half. So this is the antiderivative of the square root of u du. And now, at least according to my taste, I usually rewrite this as u to the 1 half du. Because now that I have it written as a fractional exponent, 1 half, I can see I can use what rule now? The power rule. So then this is 1 half multiplied by u to the 3 halves, because that's 1 half plus 1, divided by 3 halves, and then plus a constant. Okay, so then if you don't like writing division by 3 halves, you can write multiplication by 2 thirds. That's perfectly acceptable. But how about, let's say you did or didn't do that according to your taste. Would this be the correct answer? No, because it's phrased in terms of u, but your answer must be phrased in terms of x. So finally, finally, the answer is, uh, if you were to multiply that out, one-third multiplied by 3x squared plus 4x plus 8 to the 3 halves plus a constant. So any question about this one? Okay, so the purpose of this example, the main purpose of this example is to show you Okay, this playing around, this particular playing around right here. Yes? Um, it is one third because, right, this is division by one half and this is multiplication by two thirds. The twos will cancel and then you have one third. Okay, so any question about this? Okay, so then before we go, I just want to say this. So then the, the other purpose of this example was to show you that, okay, right, we're trying to decompose a question into two pieces, u and du, u and du. Until you get accustomed to this, you're going to make some wrong choices. You're going to say that, okay, I'm going to try u as this thing, okay, and you will just choose incorrectly. That's fine. Okay, so then some general comments are that, you know, whatever you choose for u, its derivative must also appear. Right? So if, if u shows up, then u's derivative must also show up if you're going to successfully use uh, the substitution procedure. Okay, next is that even if you choose incorrectly, even if you choose incorrectly, it's at most five, six lines, okay, in one or two minutes of your life. Okay. The problem is that in my experience of teaching is this, is that students, especially the students who are doing good in the class at this particular junction, especially the students who think that they're clever, okay, I'm talking to you, what happens is, is that I see students sit here and look at questions like this, substitution questions, and they try and sort of, I guess, do it all in the, do it all in the brain, right, all in the head without writing anything down. And I watch them stare at it and stare at it and stare at it and then turn in a blank response. Of course, a blank response gets a zero. So what I'm trying to encourage you to do is, if you don't know what to do, use the following assumption. 
that I gave you a question and it has an answer. So if you don't see what to do, if you haven't written anything down for 30 seconds, then just say you as anything and try it. And if it, if it works, great. If it doesn't, 60 seconds gone. Try you as something else. Okay, don't sit there and look at it and do nothing and turn in a blank response. See you on Wednesday. <coughs>